Welcome to Real Chemistry. Today we're going to normalize the particle in the box wave function. So you might have finished the derivation for your particle in the box, and after taking into account this potential, right, where you have those infinite walls and then no potential in the middle of the box, you get this wave function. And you still don't know the value of A. The way you get the value of A is by normalizing that wave function. This is a step that's skipped in a lot of derivations because it takes a little time and you've already been taught how to normalize a wave function. So in this video, we're just going to show you explicitly how do you normalize this wave function. One critical thing to keep in mind, right, this solution is really a bunch of solutions. This n value can take on any positive whole number, right? So it can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to infinity. So n is a bunch of different numbers, and we can pick out different solutions for the particle in the box wave functions by selecting different n's as long as we follow those rules. That's going to be important in the normalization process. Let's go ahead and take a look at how you normalize this wave function. All right, so to normalize it, what we're going to do is first write down the complex conjugate. That turns out to be a breeze in this case, right? The complex conjugate of this guy, there's no i anywhere, so the complex conjugate is exactly the same as our original wave function, a sine n pi x over l. All right, then we're gonna go ahead and set the integral equal to one. So we've done step one, now we're gonna do step two. And this is just the standard way to normalize a wave function, right? So we're gonna say the integral, in this case from zero to l, because that's the size of our box, of a squared, because we get two a's, and sine squared, because we get two sines, dx is going to be equal to 1. All right, now we're going to go ahead and integrate and solve for n. Critically, here, this integral is a little tough. This is why it's often skipped in the derivations. Now, if you have an integral key, not so bad. Or you can use some trig functions. That also works, or trig identities, I should say. So we're going to use that integral key for sine squared, uh, and then bx is in the argument of our sine. Notice we can, as always, pull out our a. So our a will take that out front, get rid of the a inside. And that's nice because you notice we don't see any constant in our integral key as usual. So now what we need to do is we need to identify what that constant is to be able to use our integral key. And the easiest way to identify these constants is just look at the argument in your sign and look at the argument in the integral key and just set them equal to each other. So what we can say is, okay, bx is equal to the argument in our sign n pi x over L. And the x's are gonna cancel. And what that means is we're going to go ahead and get just that b is equal to n pi over L. So that's our B. And that's going to let us easily solve this integral. So we're going to get a squared, and we're going to evaluate whatever our result is from 0 to L. And now we're going to use the other half of our integral key to write down the result. So we get x over 2, that's the first part of our solution. Doesn't depend on what our constant was in there. Minus sine. Notice that this says 2 times B. So what we're going to get is 2 n pi over l, that's 2 times b, and then we're still going to have our x. And that sine is itself over 4b, 4, in this case, times n pi over l. Now normally you'd like to simplify what was on the bottom there. I'm going to leave it for a second, and you'll see why soon. Remember, we're going to evaluate this from 0 to l. All right, well, that means we're going to get a squared l over 2, when we plug in l. And then what's going to happen up top is we're going to go ahead and see that sine, so let's just take a look at what happens with the sine over here. We're going to be plugging in l, right? So we're going to get 2 n pi, and then we're going to get l over l. So that's what we're going to get when we plug in l to our sine. We can cancel those l's. And now something important happens. We have 2n times pi. That second guy is a pi, even though it's not very clear. And remember, what can our n's be? Our n can be 1 or 2 or 3. And the number up here is 2, right? And so whenever we take any whole number and multiply it by 2, we get an even number. If you recall, 
the uh, even, uh, the sign of uh, n times pi, where n is even, is zero. So that whole thing goes to zero, because no matter what we plug in for n, we'll get zero out of our sine function. Go ahead and try that a few times on your calculator. Plug in two times three pi into sine. Plug in two times six pi into sine, and you'll see that you get zero every single time. So that turns out to be zero. So we don't get anything for this whole big messy argument, and that's why I didn't simplify it, minus zero. All right, now let's plug in our zero bound, zero over two, well that gives us zero. And once again, when we plug in zero for x in that sign, our sign is gonna become zero. So this whole second part of our argument is zero. This, remember, is all equal to one because we're normalizing. That's how we're gonna solve for a. And what that means is that all this complicated mess boils down to something pretty nice and simple. We get a squared times L over two equals one. So this guy drops out, it's equal to zero. This guy, well, not the whole thing, sorry. The zero obviously drops out because it's obviously equal to zero. And that means we get this nice a squared times L over two is equal to one. Now we just solve for one and we're going to go ahead and see that we get a squared equals two over L. And that implies that A is equal to square root of two over L. Notice something cool here, right? We didn't assume anything about the value of N. So we just normalized not one particle in the box solution, we normalized all of them. So you never gotta do it again, awesome. All right, what's our final wave function then? Psi of X, and all we gotta do is plug in our new value that we've determined for A square root of two over L sine n pi x over L. Boom, done. So that's how we normalize the particle in the box wave function. We've normalized all of them. Turns out the integration constant or that normalization constant square root of two over L, where L is the length of your box. Notice sometimes for your box length, you'll use the variable A, and then it's just square root of two over A. It doesn't matter what variable you use for box length. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry on Normalizing the Particle in the Box. Go ahead and subscribe by clicking the real icon, the real chemistry icon below.